right here. Let's get the code pulled up. It's turning on, give me a sec. All right, lecture 37. Um, let's get started. Oh, wait, no, we're on lecture 38. Oh, I had, oh, I, know what that I had this announcement slide uh, changed from last year, but um, this is the code we want. But because the internet's not working on this computer, the um, uh, it's it didn't sync. So this is the code that you want. But my announcements um, uh, aren't any different than last time. I, last year I had this lecture pre-recorded, so that's why I don't have any announcements here. Um, the only thing I guess worth mentioning is that our attendance grades are up to date, and um, I know we're a little behind on homework grading uh, and whatnot. But um, I guess my question is, how did this last homework go, the low CV design problem? Did that work out pretty well? A little iffy. Maybe today's lecture will help reinforce it a little bit. Um, today we're going to do a high CV design example. And um, really the only difference between what we did last time and what we're doing today is a lot of page flipping. So I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have to flip between table 310 and table 32 a lot, okay? So you'll like look up here, then look here, then look here, then look here. So I'm just preparing you for that. Um, and that's just sort of the nature of high CV design. Um, so uh, we'll just get right into it. Okay. <coughs> All right. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, now, we talked about this a little bit last time. And... Um, so the process for designing discreetly braced beams are that we first compute the MU and the VU, the, the maximum moment and the maximum shear. We have to assume a self-weight. Um, typically, if we have a longer LB, or if we're looking at maybe a girder, we might use 100 pounds per foot. If we're looking at a regular old floor beam, maybe 50 pounds per foot. Um, those assumptions, you just get better at that with experience and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we do is we compute a minimum required moment of inertia uh, based on whatever deflection limits are in the problem. And I, I list that separately because those can change. And we might have a problem in here where we don't have a deflection limit, so we can just skip that. Uh, we look at um, uh, our LB for design, which is usually the longest unbraced length uh, for the beam in question, and the CB for that uh, segment. Then we go to table 310. Uh, in table 310, or the beam charts, sometimes you'll hear me call those the beam charts. On the x-axis, we go to our unbraced length. The y-axis, we go to MU over CB. We find that point, uh, and then we go up and to the right, and um, we uh, uh, find the, the, the section that works. Um, we want to make sure that that section meets the moment of inertia requirements before we go uh, down the road of analyzing for shear moment deflection, but by and large, that's the process. Um, <coughs> this uh, slide probably makes a little bit more sense after the homework last time, which is that um, what if you have a beam that has multiple unbraced segments, uh, all sorts of different CV values. You know, if you look at a beam like this, each segment has a unique unbraced length, each segment has a unique maximum moment, and each segment has a unique CV, right? So um, how do you, like, design a problem? Uh, how do you design this beam? Um, what I would do is I would um, find the segment that has either the largest LB or the largest uh, MU over CB. Um, I said just a second ago, probably go with the one with the largest LB, but there's a good chance in most real world applications that these two are the same segment that the one with the largest moment is also the one with the largest uh, LB. And I, I, the example that I'm talking about is like a beam that has regular um, discrete bracing, but the moments increase as we get towards the middle. So <clears throat> if not, um, I guess maybe go with the one with the largest uh, moment, um, although I, I think either one's fine. But ultimately, it, it, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but you're going to have to analyze all the segments to verify its capacity anyway. So um, as long as you 
ultimately assess that the beam that you selected has enough adequate capacity for all the segments, then you're good. And I say that some can be neglected by observation. That part probably makes a lot more sense after the homework assignment that you just did because we had three end brace segments for that assignment, but the two end ones had really low LB values and really high CB values. So we knew that they weren't going to govern. So we just, you don't really have to worry about them. Uh, and then for moments, <coughs> whichever segment has the largest performance ratio or efficiency is the one that we care about. Now, this is the exercise that we did last time. And I started looking into this lab, uh, after our discussion last time, because if you remember, you all found a W27 by 84, and I have here on the slide a W24 by 84. I think what happened is the, um, the it, I actually pulled my old manual and I looked at this one, and there's actually a slight difference in how they're plotted. Um, I'm actually still a little unsure about it because um, I did the math for a W24 by 84 for these parameters, and it should have worked. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually a little confused on that one. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I don't want to go as far as to say it's a misprint, but I feel like that line should have been bolded uh, in that region. But the point is going to um, uh, uh, translate across uh, either way. Because if you were to select the W27 by 84, the problem is that the moment or the plastic moment capacity is too low. And this is what I was talking about last time with the idea with false positives. See, whenever you look in table 310, 310, you are dividing out the effects of CB, right? Remember, the moment capacity is augmented by CB. CB serves to increase your moment capacity, right? But you cannot increase your moment capacity past the plastic moment. The plastic moment is the largest moment capacity that a beam can withstand. So whenever you have a really, really high CB value, what happens is that you can generate a false positive. You can pick a section out of table 310 that looks like it works, but when you actually look at the plastic moment capacity, you find, no, it's not going to work. And so that's what I mean when I say we have a, a false positive, okay? So, um, the, uh, the, you know, again, CB serves to increase MN. Remember, we have our beam chart, right? And then CB serves to take uh, MN uh, and make it larger, um, which makes sense theoretically. I mean, when we derived our, our equation for LTB, we assume that every section has to buckle simultaneously, which isn't the case if you had just a beam with a point load in the middle. The only section that has to point, uh, buckle is the, the section in the middle. <clears throat> so CV serves to up your capacity, but you can't increase that capacity past the plastic moment, okay? And the problem is you can't count for this cutoff in the design phase because the design chart that we're using is accounting for a CV value of one. Um, so you're checking, you're, you're, you're finding a section that looks like it works, but it really doesn't. And so this is why, like, whenever we pick a section, remember the last step is to analyze it, it's incredibly important that we do so because we want to make sure that the section that we pick actually works. So <clears throat> what happens when you get a false positive? So let's say, this is I know from the last manual, but let's say you know you found your point and this is the uh, section that you're interested in. What happens is you just keep on looking. You just keep on going until you find a section that works. And you just keep on going until you find one that has at least a plastic moment capacity um, greater than your moment, and then that's the section uh, that you analyzed. One of the things that I mentioned uh, when we first started looking at this, if you start getting a uh, situation where the lines are really kind of bunched up, you might find it easier to trace upwards as opposed to tracing up and to the right, because it can get a little uh, uh, collected um, in this area here. So I just, I just want to mention that. And don't worry, we're going to get some practice on this today. <clears throat> what we're going to do today is we're going to set up like a little table um, to look at our trial sections. What we're going to do is we're going to look up a trial section. So let's say we pick the W24 by 84. We have an MU of, let's say, 10, 20 foot kips, and the VMP is 840. So that's no good. Now, we could check the moment of inertia, but really who cares, right? Because if, if this section doesn't work, then I don't care whether or not it meets stiffness requirements. It doesn't matter. So then I would go to the next section, let's say a W27 by 84, look up the moment capacity, look up the uh, plastic, or sorry, report the maximum moment that's applied to the beam, which is the same as it was before, look up the plastic moment capacity. It doesn't work. And again, who cares about the deflections? 
So the next section might be a W30 by 90. Now the W30 by 90 has a plastic moment capacity of 1060. That means that it's at least worth checking out, okay? But it's not worth checking out if it also doesn't meet the moment of inertia requirement. So again, the, uh, the moment of inertia requirement is 2800. What's the moment of inertia for a 30 by 90? It's this. So now this is a section that's worthy of analyzing. And again, we still don't know if that W30 by 90 is gonna work because we have to analyze it, but it's at least a worthy section to analyze. At least we know that it's possible that it'll work. And that's kind of what the idea behind this is uh, uh, in, in this analysis. Now, if we get to this point right here and we find that uh, it still doesn't have a high enough moment of inertia, what we would do is just abandon everything that we're doing with table 310 and table 32 and just pick a section out of table 33. Uh, because it, it, in the end, we would find the strength isn't governing its deflections. Now, you know me, <coughs> I think that the easiest way of going about this is to just do a problem. So let's do this problem, okay? So um, this is a simply supported beam subjected to a point load at mid-span. Uh, and this is a really classical problem for uh, a situation where you have a really, really high CV value um, because a point load in the middle uh, for a beam uh, uh, results in a CV value of 1.67. So it's a realistic uh, problem. And it's also a pretty high CV value. Um, we have a live load of 65,000 pounds right at the middle of the beam. Um, and the only dead load on the beam is the self weight, which we're going to assume to be 100 pounds per foot. And uh, we're going to also ensure that this beam uh, meets a live load deflection limit of L over 360. Okay. So um, again, uh, as I mentioned, there's going to be a lot of page flipping. Okay. I'm just going to tell you that. We're going to look at a section in table 310, then we're going to go to table 32. Then table 310, 32. 310, 32. We're going to do that a lot. So I'm just, I'm just preparing you for that now. Um, but we're not going to do that for a little bit. Okay? Everybody good? Now, the first part of this problem is the same that we've been doing for the past few lectures, which is um, let's analyze the beam, let's determine its maximum shear, maximum moment, all that jazz. So, so let's get into that. Okay, so we have a simply supported beam, uh, we have a distributed load, and we have a point load. So let, let's, let's handle that. So let's determine MU and VU. Okay, so this part should be relatively um, straightforward. This should be um, the stuff we've been doing so far. Um, so I'm going to write this down here so I don't have to scroll too much. So so we're going to have a self weight of 100 pounds per foot, which I'm going to make a big note here that that is assumed. Um, we have a span length. Of, in this case, 20 feet, right? The, the beam is 20 foot long, so it's just 10 feet between unbraced segments. And we also have a live load of 65 kips, okay? So I can scroll down a little bit. Okay, <coughs> so dead load and uh, dead load shears and moments are going to be pretty straightforward. We've been doing this for the past, you know, couple weeks. So the dead load shear is going to be that and that. So, I mean, you tell me that shouldn't be too fast, right? That should be pretty straightforward at this point. Good? Okay. So um, I'll go ahead and do this one for you. Uh, this comes out to be just one kip, and this turns out to be five foot kips. Now, what about the live load shear and the live load moment? What are those? That one I'm going to get some help from you. P over two and P over, P over, two and P over four. We do not take that point load and turn it into a distributed load. That is wrong. This is a simply supported beam with a point load in the middle. So the analysis is different. This is P over 2 and P 
PL over 4. So this is 32 and a half kips. And this is 65 times 5, 325. So far, so good? I mean, again, I'm hoping by now that this part is pretty simple, right? So from here, what we can do is we can say, all right, we can say, all right, I've got VU. One point two dead plus one point six live, so one point two times one kip plus one point six times thirty two point five kips. And again, the idea is that you know really the only load that this beam is intended to withstand is the live load. You know the only dead load on it is self weight, so the live load is definitely going to um, uh, be the one that that controls a lot of our design. So I need some help on this. stick these values over here just so we have them for reference. Do I have a second on that? Yep. Okay. Alright, so this is 53.2 kips. So what about MU? Losing my MU is going to be the one that matters. 58? I'm getting a higher value. 526. That's what I got, like 526 something. Might have been a decimal point. So what'd you get, just 526? You get 526 even. Second? Okay. All right, so MU is 526 foot kips. And that's going to be, for the most part, the star of our show. Okay? Now, we were given the CB value of 1.67. We were given that for this problem, so we're just going to use that. If we weren't given it, we could just look it up in table 3.1. So, okay. All right. So now, before we start looking sections up, the only thing left to do is the computer required moment of inertia. So we need a computer required moment of inertia. Um, this beam has a, so we're looking at live load deflections only, again, like we've been doing for the past few days. What was E again, remind me? 29,000. Remember, you can set your watch by that for structural steel. And then, so what do we got? Okay. We know that the limit for this problem is L over 360, right? Which is a very common deflection limit uh, for, for floor beams. And so we have 20 feet over 360. Am I missing anything? Times 12 to convert that from feet to inches. And so what do I get for this? Two thirds. So like 0 0.667 inches, right? So what I'm going to do, so basically what I'm saying is that whatever beam I take, it cannot deflect more than 0 0.667 at the middle, okay? But what is the formula that I use to compute deflection for this beam? PL cubed over 480 EI. Did you hear that? PL cubed over 480i. It is not 5WL to the 4th over 384 EI. Okay? If you think to yourself, I need to use 5WL to the 4th over 384 EI, I want you to take your hand, I want you to do that. Okay? No. Because this beam has a point load in the middle. That's the live load. Okay? So if you think, well, I need to convert that to a distributed load. That is wrong, okay? I mean, think, here's the beam. 
What's the worst case deflection? Lumping all the load in the middle or spreading it out? It's lumping the load in the middle, right? Which is what's actually going on on this problem, right? So if you spread it out, you're being unconservative in your design. That's, that's no good. So, <coughs> so the actual deflection is is this, okay? And what I should also do is throw a conversion factor in there. What is that conversion factor? There we go. So what I'm saying is So basically what I'm doing is I'm saying this set this deflection equal to that and figure out what is the moment of inertia required to ensure that we at least meet this deflection limit. And so the way I do the math, I just swap these. So I'll say that I x required is... So, got a big old fraction. Don't forget to cube your length. And so what are we going to get for this? 967.79. That right there? Okay, do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay, so... Okay, so... What I've done here on the board, so first off, again, these first two steps, I know we went through these first steps, two steps a little fast, but this hasn't changed for the past, like, two weeks, so this is all the same that we've been doing so far, and what I did, just like we've been doing before, is I sort of made a little record over here of sort of the key values, okay, because we're going to refer to this for design, okay, so let's start getting into design, so now what we need to do is we need to pick a shape, we need to select a shape, that's going to meet these load demands. Okay. All right. Now, like I said, it's going to be a lot of page flipping. Just bear with me. Okay. So what might be a good idea is that if you're sitting next to somebody, maybe one of you have table 310 open, one of you have table 32 open, uh, because like I said, we're going to be doing a lot of page flipping. Okay. So let's go through this. Now, we're going to select our shapes from table 310. So how do we use table 310? We need a value on the x-axis and a value on the y-axis. What's the value on the x-axis? LB. Okay, so what is LB for this problem? Say it again. 10 feet. Now, what about the y-axis? We go in with MU over CB, yes. So what is MU over CB? It is 526 over 1.67. What is that? 314.97. Say again, 214.97? 314. 314.97. <coughs> so maybe we'll call it... 315, because, I mean, looking at the chart, you kind of know what I mean. It's kind of hard to find point nine seven. So we'll say MU over CB. Okay. All right. So this is good. 
this is where the care is going to take. We're going to take our time with this part. Okay. So help me out. We're going to take our time with this. I want you to tell me the very first shape that you can find that has an unbraced length of 10 feet and at least a moment capacity, according to table 310, of 315. Okay, a W21 by 48. Okay, so let's take our time. Let's make sure we can all find this. Is everybody able to find that? I'm seeing some head shakes. Good, good. Okay. All right. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Okay, and I know this is going to seem a little repetitive, but just bear with me. Okay? So, in my table, I'm going to write MU. And MU, what is MU? Let's... Make sure we're all on the same page. What is MU? Our design target over here. It's 526. <laughs> okay. Now. Now what I want you to do. So, so we found this in table 310. Now I want you to go to table 3-2. <coughs> now in table 3-2, for the 21 by 48, what is PMP? 398. 398. What does that mean? This isn't going to work. That ain't going to work. Okay? So what do we do? We go back to table 310. Again, this is what I meant. There's going to be a lot of page flipping. So let's go back to table 310. So what you did in table 310, so here's the chart. What you did in table 310 is you found the LB, and you found 315, and you found, like, that point right there. And then you looked up, right, and you found your first solid curve. What I'm saying is look up again. Find your next solid curve, okay? So past the W21 by 48, what's the next one? W21 by 55. Okay, a W21 by 55. Does everybody else see that? 21 by 55? Everybody else see that? <coughs> if you don't see that, you let me know, okay? This is important. So just so everybody's aware, what we're going to do is we're going to keep going up to the next solid curve. Keep going up until we find one that works. Okay? Like I said, there's going to be a lot of page flipping on this. Okay? For the W21 by 55, again, we have an MU of 526. What is BMP? 473. 473. Is this going to work? No good. Okay? What's the next one? Pass the W21 by 55. A W18 by 60. Again, it's got a withstand 526. What's the BMP? 461. Is that going to work? Nope. You would think that I would know how to write the letter G. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> what's the next one? A W21 by 62. A W21 by 62. All right. 526. Okay, what's its VMP? 540. 540. Oh. What about this? Is this worth analyzing? Now, I... I can't guarantee it's going to work because we still have to analyze it, but is it a worthy section to analyze? You bet. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put myself maybe a little, I don't know. Now, before we go down the rabbit hole, IX required. What was IX required? 967. What is 
is the moment of inertia of the W21 by 62? 1330. 1330. So <coughs> it's going to meet deflection requirements, right? So do we have ourselves a trial shape now? Yeah, we do. We have a W21 by 62. We think that's going to work. We think so. We don't know yet. I mean, there's not, there's a really small margin here, right? And it's possible that CB has magnified our capacity. It's still possible that CB has magnified our capacity, or, or, not, or maybe it's not and the capacity is still low. We don't know. So let's, um, let's just go through the process, okay? All right, so really I guess I should say this is step three and step four because we you know, verified the moment of inertia. So let's analyze the W21 by 62, okay? Now can somebody make a comment about this number right here, about the 62? It's lighter than we assume. It's lighter than we assume, right? We assumed that the beam would weigh 100 pounds per foot, and it's a lot less than that, right? So do I need to change these? No, right? If the beam has adequate capacity to withstand these, then I'm good, right? So I don't need to update these assumptions. I would need to update these assumptions if it was a W21 by 162, if it was heavier, right? So, so I'll put here a big circle and I'll say, lighter than, Lighter than assumption. Okay. <clears throat> so we have a candidate beam, and we need to know whether or not it has adequate uh, capacity. So we're going to check three different limit states. We're going to check moments. Bless you. We're going to check shears, and we're going to check deflections, right? Moments, shears, and deflections. Um, do we think shears are going to be a problem? No, shears aren't going to be a problem. I don't really even think deflections are going to be a problem. Like, we'll check it, but, I mean, it should be fine. So moments are really the kicker here. That's what we got to figure out, okay? So how do I compute the moment capacity of a W21 by 62? Like, this is a discreetly braced band. So how do I compute it? What do I need to do? Find what zone we're in, right? So we have an unbraced length of 10 feet. Right? And how do we determine what zone we're in? LP and LR, right? So what are LP and LR for W21 by 62? 450 KSI, I should say. Eighteen twenty said? Okay. So what zone am I in? I'm in zone two, right? Remember, zone one is if your LB is less than LP. Zone three, if it's bigger than LR. The zone two is if it's in the middle, right? So we're in zone two. And remember what I told you. I said that if you're in design mode and you're not in zone two, you either got a really big LB value and really low loads or you're doing something wrong. So more often than not, you're in zone two. Okay. So what terms do I need to compute a zone 2 capacity? What terms do I need? I need CB. CB is 1.67. I need phi and P, which I already looked up. I looked that up in the table. That was 540. Bless you. I need LB, which is 10 feet. LP, which is 6.25. What else do I need? Yeah. The beam factor, right? I need the slope of that line. So what is um, BF? 17. 17. What? 17.5 kips, right? <coughs> Alright. <coughs> so with these Remember what we do is we compute that upper expression, and then take the minimum of that and phi and p. So let's see what we get. So 
what do we get? We get CB times And again, all that is is just a linear interpolation on that zone two curve, right? Or it's not a curve, it's a straight line fit. Okay, so. Somebody help me out. Mr. Dangerfield's done enough work. We'll get somebody else to help me out. 792.2. Say it again. 792.2. 792.2. Do I have a second? Somebody besides Mr. Dangerfield. Because I know Mr. Dangerfield. He's just sitting there. He's like, oh, man, I'm ready a second. I'm going to ask for a second for Mr. Hummer. I saw that. Oh, he saw that. Hang on. I'm still right. I'm still right. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to help him. Mr. Is this somebody who did not bring their Casio FX 115ES Plus or similar size? He's just using it for something. <coughs> He's lying to you right now. It doesn't work. It work. What I have to deal with? Do I got a second? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. <coughs> In order to compute the capacity, what I'm doing is I'm taking the minimum, therefore, the capacity is the minimum of all that hullabaloo, in a very technical engineering term, hullabaloo, and VMPX. So, minimum 792.2 and 540. Which is, you know, 540. Okay, so, um, again, you know, we have a really high CV value. So when we have a high CV value, something like this was bound to happen, where we get some ridiculously high number. But again, you know, we're dealing with a problem that had a lot of false positives. This is what I mean when I say false positives. I'm saying, you know, when we were picking those initial shapes. We were picking those initial shapes thinking that this was the capacity, but this isn't the capacity. This is, you know? So that's that's what the, uh, the, the led to all those false positives. So, let me ask you a question. Do we have a section that has adequate moment capacity? Yes, we do. And how do we know that? We know that because MU is 526 and VMN is 540. So this is how much we're bending it. This is how much it can withstand in bending. It's good. So, and what's, it might have a performance ratio on that? 97%. That's a pretty good design, right? That's pretty good. <coughs> Do we have any issue on shear capacity? No. Because VU was, what was it, 53.2? And by the way, what is VVVN? 252. So again, shear is just not a problem for, for most rolled beams. In most Typical floor beam scenarios. Monday we're going to talk about how do you actually compute shear capacity and what happens when shear actually does become a problem. So, and usually that only happens in bridges and transfer elements and things like that. What's my performance ratio here? How do I keep up right now? Twenty-one percent. Yeah. Again, real, really, really tiny stuff. Um, <coughs> and. And the only thing left to do is to actually handle deflections. I don't think it's really necessary. This is just more of a formality. But if you want, we can go ahead and do it just to make sure that we had a deflection limit of 0 0.667 inches. 
and our actual deflection is five, or no, it's not five W over four. It's P L cubed over 48 EI, which is 65 kips times 20 feet to the third. Don't forget our lovely 1728, 1728 unit conversion factor. And then we have 48, 29,000. And what was the moment of inertia again for this beam? 1330. Okay. So 0.667 is how much, that is it's allowable, that's the maximum amount of def uh, deflection that we can incur, and how much are we actually going to get for this beam? 0.4. Oh, oh. We've got a comp. I, I got 0.485. We're going to draft it. So I have significant issues getting the five even round. You didn't specify how many six days. Well, I'm going to go with the same number of decimals that I reported for this. Because I, I, I just, I, that, I, I wanted that face from you. you know. I got to start. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is okay. Um, what's our performance ratio? So, <clears throat> is this a viable solution? Is this a viable answer? Yes. And what is our worst case performance ratio? What was it, 97%? So not only is this an adequate design, but this is probably a pretty efficient one too, right? I mean, it's a 97% efficiency. Remember, if you're around 90% or better, you're doing pretty good. So what's the answer to the problem? Answer is... In my big pronounced letters. Be better than that. We're using a W21 by 62. That's the answer. Okay. I mean, the whole point of the problem was pick a beam that can adequately withstand these loads. That's the beam. That's the one. And I don't think we're going to find one that's less, you know. And by less, I mean one that's that's lighter. Okay, like as an example, if you go to table three two, and look at the W twenty one by sixty two, which I think is a bold row. I mean, the next row down is a W twenty four by fifty five, and its VMP is five oh three, which is less than this. You know, like that's it. That's our answer. You know, that's our lightest beam. So, <clears throat> again, I know we went through the first part of the problem a little fast, but I know we had done that before. Um, barring all the page flipping and whatnot, how did you feel about this? It was this, this pretty straightforward, right? Again, the, the process is no different. And to be honest, the process is really no different if you're doing a continuously braced beam. It's the same idea, you know? The only difference between a continuously braced beam and a discreetly braced beam is your model for computing the moment capacity. Instead of lateral torsional buckling, it's just VMP. So, make sense? All right, does anybody have any questions on this about the process, the idea? Everybody good? Okay, so <clears throat> let me pull this up here just to give you kind of an idea. So, so. Wait, no, that was the last one. So here's our next assignment. Again, the, 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 the scenario is actually exactly the same. Um, what is changing are a little bit of the inputs, and it's going to change. Like it, it, I know that when you look at this, you're like, well, Dr. Mike, you're really not changing anything. That's true, but the iterations that you're going to have to do are going to change. Okay. The only other thing also that's going to change is you got to take a little bit of care as to how you compute your dead load moment and your dead load shear. Okay, take a little care on that. I'm actually giving you two dead loads that are different categories, like a dead load that's a distributed load and a dead load that's a point load. So you got to handle those, those carefully. I know it seems 
Well, it's the same, but just take care of your bookkeeping is all I would say. Um, all I got to do is change a couple parameters and the number of iterations that you have to do, I can change with that as well. But I think the process is going to be uh, pretty straightforward. The process is going to be pretty easy. Sound good? Okay. So just so everybody is aware, um, I want to give everybody just a quick peek into next week because next week is our last week. Okay? So Friday of next week is our exam review. Okay? So it's like we've been doing all our previous exam reviews. Monday, what I'm going to do is talk about shear. Okay? Because this whole time I've been saying, oh, we'll just look up shear capacity. But you need to know how to compute it. Okay? And I'm just curious, when it comes to shear, is there a particular number that you think is going to pop up in the equations? Remember we did block shear and there was a number that popped up? 0. 0.6. Remember that? Is 0. 0.6 going to pop up when we look at shear capacity? Yes, it will. You know, Because remember, 0. 0.6 relates your normal yield stress to your shear yield, shear yield because of von Mises. Okay, so is 0. 0.6 going to pop up? Yes, that's Monday. Wednesday, um, we're going to look at a phenomenon that we have kind of ignored, um, but we really can't. Um, and Monday or Wednesday, we're going to look at a phenomenon called local buckling. And I do want to give you just kind of an image of what local buckling looks like. Local buckling looks like this. So local buckling is when it's not the entire column that buckles or the entire beam that buckles. That would be global buckling. Local buckling is when the flange buckles or the web buckles. Okay, And what we need to do is classify shapes as to whether or not they're going to be governed by global buckling or local buckling. Now, if local buckling is an issue, it does not mean that if you put a feather on the beam that it explodes. Okay, All it means is that whenever you compute capacity, you just have to use some different models and some different equations. Um, I, uh, I, I have a good bit of experience with this. I actually, for, for my PhD, I had to characterize my tub girders as to see whether or not local buckling or distortional buckling and whatnot was going to govern, and uh, so I can talk about this stuff all day. Um, the long story short is what we do is we characterize the, um, the width to thickness ratios of the outstanding elements against some specified limits. But if you're wondering where this shows up in the manual, it, you, you might have looked over this, you might, have, you might have noticed it, but just sort of looked over it. If you look at your W shapes and you look at these little notes over here on the left, and you'll see it says like, okay, here's a W40 by 235, and then there's a little C in front of it. You're like, what the heck is this C? What it says is the shape is slender for compression. What that means is that it's going to be governed by local buckling, okay? Um, up until now, we have sort of slyly avoided local buckling, but local buckling is something you do need to consider if you're looking at bridges where you are tailoring the size of the flange and the size of the web and all that jazz for a given load demand. So it's, it, it's a lot more of a potential phenomenon. So we're going to talk about that on Wednesday, although it's going to be a pre-recorded lecture, um, and the, the means of classifying a, a, a section are really, really easy, so it's pretty straightforward. But yeah, Monday shear, Wednesday local buckling, Friday exam review. And then you are done with CE 414, and other than the exam, that means some of you are done with Marshall. And some of you are like, yeah. Any questions? All right, I'm going to pull the code one more time in case anybody missed it, and I will see you all on Monday. Y'all have a wonderful weekend.